Well, good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. And we are glad to be in the house of the Lord another time, whether you're here with us in person here at the Historic Calvary Baptist Church or whether you are watching us online. Hopefully you've had a chance to review uh, some of the information that shared with you before uh, we came on tonight so that you can govern yourself accordingly. Um, several things I do want to share with you before we jump into our lesson for tonight. Uh, one of the things I want to share with you is make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. It is good for us and important for us that we are able to expand our virtual or digital footprint. So when you like, share, and subscribe, it helps us to be able to do so. It helps us to be able to reach more people when you do that. So please make sure that you like our Facebook page, that you share it, uh, that you like our um, YouTube page, that you subscribe to it, and that you let your family and friends know uh, that those social uh, media platforms are available and they can also like, share, and subscribe. And again, that just kind of helps us to increase our outreach and our digital footprint. So we appreciate you for doing that. Secondly, we want you to continue to pray for all of our sick and shut-in members, those who are uh, in bereavement. We want to pray for the uh, Steele family uh, in their loss, their bereavement. Uh, and so please continue to keep uh, that family in prayer, the Steele, the, the, um, the Heaths, the Pattons, and the Watson families. Yes, so complete, com continue to pray for those uh, if you will. Also, if you have questions that you would like to share as a result of our time together and our lesson tonight, please make sure that you put it in the chat. Um, if you are in person with us tonight, uh, jot it on a piece of paper, if you will, pass it to our team, and they'll have an opportunity to bring it to us at the end of our time together tonight, and we'll have a conversation. So please make sure that you do those few things for us tonight, and we certainly appreciate it. It helps things to go just a little bit smoother when you help us out in those areas. Don't forget, don't forget that the November the 8th is election day. We need everybody to make sure that you do not forget that that is election day. And we want you to know all of the options and what you need to do to exercise those options. Uh, as you know, voting rules in Delaware were changed um, by the uh, Supreme Court here in Delaware. So there are some different rules governing this election, and it's a little bit different than it was in September. So it's important that you make plans to cast your vote in these critical races, uh, including our U.S. representatives and our state legislators and all of those positions. Please note that if you previously requested a no-excuse mail-in ballot, you must make a new plan to vote, okay? That is important that you make a new plan to vote. There are several ways that you need to vote and several things that you need to do to prepare yourself to make sure that your vote is cast and is counted. Make sure you check your voter registration status. Make sure you confirm your status is up to date and that your correct address is on file. That is important that you do that. Uh, early voting is now open to all registered voters in designated locations uh, in your particular county of residence. That happens through November the 6th, through November to the 6th. Uh, usually, if I'm not mistaken, you have at least until 7 p.m. Uh, in order to be able to do that. So if you didn't get a chance to do it already, uh, you can go tomorrow to the uh, designated location in your particular county of residence and do that, and you have until November the 6th to do that. So you don't have to wait until election day, but you can vote um, in person early. If you're voting by mail, I need you to really be careful with that because if you're voting by mail, you have um, official deadline to request an absentee ballot is November the 4th, November the 4th. Today is November the 2nd. So the deadline to request an absentee ballot is November the 4th. I'm going to highly suggest that if you do get a absentee ballot, 
that you not try to mail it back in because there's a good chance that it may not make it back in time for your vote to be counted. And one of the things you have to understand about here in um, Delaware is the postmark does not matter. So even if it's postmarked, uh, if the election is on the 8th and it's postmarked on the 6th, but it does not get there until after the 8th, it won't count because postmarks do not matter here in Delaware. So be sure that if you do get an absentee ballot, please make sure that you hand deliver it back to its proper location. Sign it, do all those things you need to do, and then walk it back because there's a good chance that it may not make it if you try to mail it back. And then of course, if you're voting on election day, be sure to check your polling place in advance. It may have changed. There has been some redistricting and redrawing of lines. So where you voted previously, it may have changed. So make sure that you check your polling place in advance. Uh, bring your ID and allow yourself some time. Election day polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 o'clock p.m. So those are just some of the things that we want you to be aware of so that you can make sure that you can vote and that your vote is counted. That's important. That is so important. So thank you so much for, for allowing us a little bit of time to kind of walk you through that process. If you are a member of CBC or if you're on our mailing distribution list and you got a uh, email from us, that outlines that information as well in your email. So please make sure that if you're on our email distribution list that you uh, check your email. If you didn't get it in your regular folder, make sure you check your spam folder as well. If you're not on our distribution list, please send uh, your email to uh, info at calvaryforward.org and we'll be happy to add you to our email distribution list. So if you're not receiving my weekly missives, as well as some of the other information that we disseminate, and we promise not to bombard your, your email box, but uh, when we need to get important information out to you, we do take advantage of um, electronic mail to do that. So if you're not on the list and you're not getting my weekly missives and you're not getting some of the information, please make sure you shoot your email to uh, info at calvaryforward.org and we'll be sure to add you to the email distribution list. All right, so let's jump into the lesson a little bit tonight. I wanna continue our conversation on discerning God's call. Um, this is a little, this is important for us because it helps us to navigate the authenticity and the challenge of walking out our purpose, uh, the purpose of God on our lives. So this is, this is hopefully helpful and it has been helpful to you. And as we begin to come to the end of this series, hopefully uh, you've gained something that will help you uh, as you walk out the purpose of God in your life. During our last time together, uh, we had a little bit of a conversation about some of the mistakes we make when we're discerning the call of God on our life. And we were able to get through about through a couple of them, and then I wanna finish that list, and then I wanna move in another direction uh, for us tonight. So for a matter and for purposes of review, uh, we mentioned about four points in particular. Hopefully you've had a chance to write them down for those of you take notes. Um, and I want you to know that this is not an exhaustive list, of course, by any means. Uh, so as a matter of review, here's that short list. Number one, uh, just because, again, you cannot give a date, a date, a day, a date, and a time of your call does not mean it did not happen. So please don't be frustrated or overly impressed with people who can do that. There are some people who can give you day, date, and time. They can tell you where they were and what they were doing when it happened. But then there are some other people who do not have the ability to do so because theirs did not happen like that. So if you're one of those people that cannot give day, date, and time of your call, don't allow that to be distracting for you because I'm one of those people. I can't give you day, date, and time but I do know what happened. So uh, that's one of the mistakes that I don't want you to make. Just because you don't know when it happened, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. The second thing is you want to avoid assuming that discernment of your call is a private matter. Uh, 
you, and you hear me say it all the time, and you probably heard it say it often, that uh, when God called a person, that was between um, them and God. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true from a biblical perspective, and it's not true from a historical perspective. Because if you're going to be doing ministry in the community, the community should have a right uh, to vet you, to vet that call. And so discernment does not happen in private. It is not a private matter. Yes, God may have talked to you, but when you turn around and get ready to talk to us, we need to know that you have been properly vetted uh, and that you are properly authorized to be able to do so, that you have the capacity to do so. So it is not a private matter. It is not a private matter. We want to ensure that the community, the community of faith in particular, is involved in that process. Number three, we want to avoid confusing seasonal assignments with lifetime appointments. We want to make sure that we're hearing God not just about what to do, but about uh, where to do it and then even how long to do it because there may be a particular instance that God wants to use you to do a particular thing, but he may only want you to do it at that particular time, and it may not be a gift that you walk in permanently. It may be a gift that you walk in seasonally or temporarily. So you need to make sure that you don't confuse seasonal assignments with lifetime appointments. And then we try to look for the right spot rather than allowing God to lead us to the right spot. This is important because one of the things that you're going to continuously hear me talk about as we go through this lesson is this issue of trial and error. This issue of trial and error. I know that in uh, some theological circles, people avoid this conversation about trial and error. They act like you're always going to hit it on the nose every time, and this is not going to happen. So I have to continue to emphasize that, that trial and error will come into play when we are discerning the call of God on our life. One of the, one of the important aspects of this point is that we get past the fear and the anxiety of making a mistake. And I know I've said this, but I think it's worth saying again. You will make a mistake. You will not always get it right. You will not always make the right decision. Uh, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Lord, help me say it to somebody tonight. Don't be afraid to make a mistake because the human factor will lead you sometimes. Y'all you, know we get in our feelings sometimes. Y'all know we get, we get really anointed for about five minutes, and in that five-minute window, we start making decisions that we have not completely thought through. Y'all looking at me like y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but y'all know, know how we get sometimes. We get excited. We get excited that God is even talking to us, and we don't even stay long enough to hear everything he got to say. We just get excited that he's speaking to us, that he's revealing things to us, and we begin to move without the benefit of full instruction. And so that human factor will always get us in trouble. It will get us in trouble, and guess what? You're going to make a mistake. Don't let people make you believe that because you're anointed, you're not going to make a mistake. Because number one, you're not always under that anointing. Yeah, that's right too. So, so that human factor will play into that sometimes. And sometimes you will get in your flesh thinking you're in the spirit. Uh, so the grace that has been extended to us, however, gives us the capacity to recover. And I, you'll hear me say this probably twice, maybe three or four times tonight. If you make a mistake and you realize you made a mistake, correct yourself. Don't, don't keep going down a road that you know you're not supposed to be on. If you see that you've moved into an area and that's not the area that you quite need to be in, don't be afraid to come out of it. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I thought that's where I was supposed to be. But that's not where I'm supposed to be. And it's not because I'm in my feelings. It's not because it's more difficult than I thought it should be. It's just not where I'm supposed to be. So don't be afraid to make that turn and come out of that if you need to do so. So let's pick up the fifth factor tonight, which is where I want to spend just a couple of minutes and talk about it. And this is the one that, again, I need for you to really pay attention to this one. 
And this fifth factor that we did not get a chance to, to really delve into in depthly uh, last time was this issue of degree of difficulty. This issue of degree of difficulty. People assume that if it's hard, it must not be God. Because if it was God, it wouldn't be hard. And that is a mistake. I'm going to say it one more time. That is a mistake. People assume that if it's hard, it's wrong, it's not God. Now, a critical misinterpretation of theology suggests that you can determine that you are on the wrong path when you experience suffering. And when you get back on the right path, things suddenly become easy again. That's some people's theological interpretation. And that idea takes us a little bit back to the fourth factor that we just finished talking about that deals with what we talked about. Y'all remember the conversation we had on contentment versus satisfaction? Well, we intrinsically believe that our vocations are designed to make us happy, which also causes us to believe that if we are unhappy, it is the sign that we're doing something wrong. Oh, Lord. Can I say that one more time? We intrinsically believe that our vocations are designed to make us happy, which causes us to believe that if we are unhappy, it is the sign that we're doing something wrong. Well, I'm going to tell you something, and, and you're going to flinch a little bit, but that's okay. You, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Um, God is more interested in our obedience than he is our comfort. Mm. Let me try it one more time. God is more interested in our obedience than he is our comfort. And if you don't believe me, ask Jesus. Come on, y'all. Ask Jesus. Go visit him in the garden. When he's praying to God about the assignment on his life, and he says to God, if there be another way, I need some Bible readers in here. Let this cup pass from me. That don't sound happy. That doesn't sound happy. So, 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 so our vocations are not always designed to make us happy, which sometimes causes us to believe that if I'm unhappy, then this is a sign that I'm doing something wrong. That's just not necessarily true. The factor on the degree of difficulty requires two things that I want you to make sure you write down. Discernment and wise counsel. Discernment and wise counsel. Sometimes if you're in a place and you're not sure how you feel about the place, have a conversation with a trusted voice. Get somebody else to help you navigate that. Because the one thing you don't want to do is you, want, you don't want to make decisions about your walk with God based on your emotions. Can I say that one more time? You, you, don't, want to make dis, you don't want to make decisions about your walk with God based on how you feel. Because one of the things we can all agree on is our feelings change every day. Some days were good, some days were bad. Depends on what side of the bed we woke up on today. And so please do not make decisions about the purpose of God on your life according to how you feel. If you're in a place where you're struggling, make sure you talk to a trusted voice that can provide the proper framework and context to what you need to know so that you can make a right decision. But don't do it because you're in a bad mood, okay? So, intrinsically, our vocations are, uh, intrinsically we believe, our vocations are to make us happy. Now, I'm not saying you need to be miserable, but sometimes, which, what I'm going to talk about a few minutes here, sometimes God is stretching you, and stretching you is uncomfortable. Stretching you can make you feel unhappy. Stretching you can make you feel like, I don't want to do this. And so we have to be able to discern what exactly is going on in those particular moments of our life when things get hard, because they will. I don't care if you're doing something you like. 
You're going to go through seasons where it gets hard. It gets difficult. You got to deal with difficult people. You got to deal with difficult circumstances. You got to make difficult decisions. Uh, You've got to do things that's going to cause people to alter their relationship with you. So it's going to get hard. It's, it's going to get hard. And you got to make sure that you properly discern the degree of difficulty so that you don't make a decision that takes you out of the will of God. So we have to be able, we have to be able to discern the difference. Watch this. This is what I want you to, I want you to, I want you to pay attention. We have to be able to discern the difference between difficulty that is the result of development versus difficulty that is the result of disobedience. Can I give it to you one more time? We have to be able to discern the difference between difficulty that is the result of development versus difficulty that is the result of disobedience. Let me see if I can work this out for you just a little bit. Discernment and wise counsel is so important. Watch this, y'all. Don't miss me. Don't miss this. Discernment and wise counsel is important. Watch this. Because the pain can be identical. Oh, wait. Come on, y'all. Come on. Watch this. Watch this. Let me, let me, work, let me work, this, work this out with you. Uh, is the difficulty the result of development Or is the difficulty the result of disobedience? The the reason the sermon is important because the pain that is the result of the difficulty from development is the same pain as the difficulty that's the result of disobedience. Oh, Lord. Y'all got to hear me tonight. Pain is pain. It's pain. And and so it's not a different kind of pain. It hurts. It hurts. For, for, okay, for example, when I go to the doctor, m- most people who know me, and, you know, if, if you know me, I, I'm challenged when it comes to needles. I don't, I, I don't, I don't do needles. That's, 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 for, that's for somebody else. That ain't for me. So if, if, if a needle is involved, we're going to have some issues. Okay, y'all, see, y'all, y'all ain't going to tell the truth, okay? Yeah, yeah, if, if, if a needle is involved, we're going to have problems. We're going to have to talk about this a little bit before we proceed with this process. But watch this. When, you go to the doc- when I go to the doctor and I have to face the challenge of a needle, the, the, shot, the shot may be for my good, but pain is still involved. Okay, y'all, y'all, y'all hear what I'm saying? I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I might get a, I might get a flu shot that's for my good, but guess what? When I got the shot, it hurt. Yeah. So, 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 so you, it's hard to use pain as the identifier because the same pain that you feel when it's development is also the same pain you feel when it's disobedience. It's the same way when we assess our placement in ministry. The key is discerning whether the pain is the result of God stretching you or the struggle that accompanies disobedience. Now, when you talk about the disobedience, you've also got to take it to another level. And the next level of dealing with disobedience is, is it willful or unwillful? Oh, oh. So, so, so before, I, before I elaborate a little bit further, before I go further, let me make sure we understand the difference between willful and unwillful. Let me, let me make sure we're clear on willful and unwillful. Willful sinning or willful disobedience would be knowing something is wrong, having other options, and still choosing to do it anyway. That, that's willful. That is willful disobedience. That is willful sinning. When you know something is wrong and you have other options, but you choose to do it anyway, that's willful. Uh, Jonah, in his attempt to avoid the assignment of God, uh, that's willful disobedience because you, you were told a particular thing and you had the option 
of doing what he told you to do, but you chose to do the wrong thing. That's willful disobedience. That, that's, that's willful. Now, unwillful could happen a lot of different ways. And I got to be very careful about this because I don't want nobody to I don't want nobody to come up with no shenanigans about, oh, it was just unwillful. I, you know, no, 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 no. I don't want you. I want you to do that. Um, but when we talk about unwillful disobedience, it could be forced. Or it might be unknowingly doing something. For example, there are two instances in the Bible, and and I I really wish I had time to unpack this theologically, but I don't, so just kind of take it and then we'll work with it a little bit later on. But there are two instances in the Bible where people lied about something that produced a favorable result. Now, watch this. Just because they lied don't make it right. Let me establish that fact first. But there are two instances in the Bible where people lied about something that, had, that produced a favorable result. They didn't get in too much trouble about it. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 21, Pharaoh, if you remember, had issued this decree to kill all the male Hebrew babies. Y'all remember that? And there were two midwives that are named in that passage, Shipra and Puah who kept these babies alive, and when Pharaoh wanted to know why the babies were not being killed, Shipra and Pua told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were having babies too fast for them to keep up with. That's how some of them were slipping through, slipping through the cracks and not being killed. Well, did they lie? Yeah, they did. It was a lie. I don't care how you clean it and spray it with Lysol. It was a lie. And then there's the other example in Joshua chapter 2, verse 5. Y'all remember that story? When, when Rahab, Rahab the harlot, lies to protect the Israelite spies that were in her house. Because when they came looking for them, she said, they ain't here. They hanging over. She knew they, 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 they right over there. They, you know. And so, and so there, 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 are some, there are some instances there. Uh, another example is when a person could be operating as a result of incorrect teaching. Some, some people could be operating off of what they were taught. And what they were taught was wrong. You understand what I'm saying? For, and I don't want to really get into doctrinal issues and that kind of thing, but I, I, oh, baptism, for instance. There, there, are, there are some Christian denominations who feel like and who believe that baptism is essential to salvation. And they believe that if a person does not, is not baptized in water, then they do not have the remission of their sin. And they're a Christian organization. They're a Christian denomination that believe that. All right. So 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 there's a whole lot of theological context that you have to deal with. So some people operate in error because they've been taught incorrectly. Okay? So so the Bible the Bible however does make distinction. So you're saying, well bishop, does the Bible make distin- distinction between willful and unwillful? Yes it does. The Bible makes distinction between what is called willful and ignorant sin. If you go to the Old Testament, if you go to Old Testament law, provisions were made regarding sacrifices for unintentional sins. As a matter of fact, if you go to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, watch what it says. It says these preparations, talking about uh, the priest who go into um, the tabernacle to make sacrifices on behalf of the people. It says in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, these preparations having thus been made, the priest go regularly into the first section of the tabernacle is what he's talking about, perform their ritual duties, but in the second only the high priest goes. And he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and watch this, the unintentional sins of the people. 
So even the Bible, rep- even the Bible recognizes that there is unwillful or unintentional sin. Even the Bible uh, makes room for that. Now, the difference between what makes it willful or unwillful is intent. That is what makes it willful or unwillful, intent. In willful sin, your intent is to do what you want to do even when you know what you're doing is wrong. That's intent. That's, that, that's, that's premeditated sin. Come on, somebody. You, you, you know that's wrong, and you have other options, but you choose to do it anyway. That's intent. That's intentional. That, that's intentional. You could have walked away from the person, but you didn't. You had other options. And so now you've smeared your Christian testimony with your bad language. Okay, y'all, not hear what I'm, what I'm saying. You, 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 had a, you had an option. You, you, had a way, you didn't have to do that. Amen. Come on, y'all. Don't, don't get quiet now. You, you didn't have to. Amen. You wanted to. Your, your flesh got the best of you. But it's still intentional because you had options. And you chose what you chose to do what made you feel better versus doing what was right. That's intentional. I know you don't like it. You don't have to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wrong. It, it's, come on, y'all. <laughs> but you say, well, Bishop, that just feels so good. At, no, you, well, first of all, if you felt that good, um, you might need to spend some time on the altar because... <laughs> Yeah, if you felt that good, because the Holy Ghost should have did something. Okay, y'all ain't saying so the Holy Ghost should have should have should have done some kind of convicting right there that made you say, "Yeah, I feel good for a minute, but now, oh no, 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 no." So, all right. So, so, so in willful sin, your intent is to do what you want to do, rather than doing the right thing. Knowing God is not pleased with what you're about to do, but you just go skip your hips on down through there and do it anyway. In unwillful sin, you don't mean to offend. You don't mean to. It was not your intention to do that. But here's the thing that you got to remember. Whether it's willful or unwillful, it's still sin, and it still requires forgiveness. Come on, y'all. Come on. It's still, whether you meant to or not, it's still sin, and it still requires forgiveness. Just because you didn't intend to do it does not mean you don't need to go through the same process as you would if you did intend to do it. Because in both cases, whether it's willful or unwillful, there must be acknowledgement and repentance. Watch this. Don't miss this. There must be acknowledgement and repentance upon realization. Once you, even if you did it unintentionally, once you realized you shouldn't have, then there has to be acknowledgement and repentance. Are y'all here? So, so, so to, to elaborate on this point of discerning uh, a right or wrong path, here's the bad news. There is no specific formula. And I know some of y'all want me to give you the ABCs of discerning a right or wrong path. There is none. There is no specific formula. I know some people will try to come up with one. But it, it may not be applicable to your situation. So there is no ABC formula for discerning a right or a wrong path. 
outside of the leading of the Holy Spirit, of course, we understand that. It's difficult to know whether or not your difficulty is the result of God stretching you or there is some level of disobedience, whether it be willful or unwillful, happening in your life in that moment. It's, it's difficult to know that. It, it really is. It's difficult to know that. And as much as I hate repeating myself, we're going to have to, one, seek God for discernment and learn some level of comfort with trial and error. I can't get away from that. I can't get away from that. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to get to some level of comfort with trial and error. And I'll suggest this to you. You have to trust God with your whole life and not part of your life. Amen. Can I say it again? You, you have to trust God with your whole life and not part of your life. Uh, uh, and I will repeat myself on this point. You have to correct yourself when you discover that you've made a wrong turn. I don't know how, I don't know how, how many times I have to say that before we get that in our spirit. You have to correct yourself. Intentional or unintentional, you have to correct yourself when you've made a wrong turn. You just have to do that. Now, I want to I wanna make sure y'all get those questions in because I want to kind of introduce this next part, and then um, we're, we're going to come to the table, and then we're going to um, have a little conversation. So let me shift our conversation just a little bit because I want to... I want to move to another level of discerning our call, and here it is. It's called managing the tension. It's called managing the tension. And I, let me just introduce this, and then uh, those who are coming to the table tonight to share with us can get ready to do that. Managing the tension. We, we've talked about, we've talked about uh, what it means to be called. We, we've talked about that. We've, we've talked about discerning uh, what we've been called to do uh, in, some, in some sense. Uh, sometimes whether it's uh, you discover that through spiritual gifts. Of course, you discover that through prayer. Uh, you discover that through trial and error. So we've talked about what it means to be called, discerning what we've been called to do. We've talked about navigating some of the expectations and the nuances of being called. And we've also talked about recognizing some of the misnomers and, the myth, and some of the myths that sometimes accompany our calling. What about the tension that exists within our calling and how do we live with those tensions? Okay? Because here's the other piece that I want you to know, and we talked a little bit about this before too. Um, every, every day that you're walking in your calling is going to be a little different, okay? It's going to be a little different for a lot of reasons. One reason it's going to be different is because you are, you're learning new things. You're learning new things about your call. You're learning new things about yourself. Uh, so every day is going to be a little bit different. You're going to grow a little bit. You're going to grow a little bit. Some things that you, you weren't able to endure last year, you're now able to endure this year. Some, some, some things that almost took you out last time, um, uh, the devil going to have to come a little stronger the next time because you've grown in some areas. Uh, you've gotten better in some areas. Uh, you've matured, if you will, in some areas. But here's the thing that we don't talk a lot about, and I, I want to put this out there for us to, for us to uh, think about. There are tensions that exist within our calling. And there are tensions that we have to live with and we have to learn how to manage. What if you've been called? Let me, let, me, let me put it out there for you like this. What if you know you've been called and you're walking out your calling and you're doing it in the place where you know God has called you to do it, but you're tired? You are stressed, you are overwhelmed, you are aggravated. Now, now, now catch the context. Don't miss the context. You know you've been called. You're walking out your calling. You're doing it in the place where you know the Lord would have you to do it, but you're tired 
you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, you're aggravated. How is that possible? How is it possible for me to know that I'm doing what God told me to do? And I know I'm doing it where he told me to do it. And I, and, 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 and I know the context in which I'm doing it is the context, is the right context. But I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I'm aggravated. What that means is you're suffering from this disease, this disease called imbalance. Hmm. If I know, if I'm sure about, watch me, y'all. If I'm sure, if I know this is what I've been called to do, and I'm walking it out, and I'm doing it where I know God has put me in the place to do it, but I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm aggravated, it means that I'm suffering from the dis-ease of imbalance. Hmm. Mm. Because, watch this, because here, 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 here it is. You're good with function, you're just not good with practice. You know what to do, you know how to do it. You even, you, you, you know what to do, you know how to do it. But, watch this, you are inept when it comes to when and how much. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because see, cause see, here's kind of what, what that looks like. You know, you know when you're good at something. You know when you, you, you y'all can, y'all can, y'all can stick your chest out a little bit tonight. You, you, you know when you're good at what you do. No, nobody, nobody can do it like you can. But 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 you've either convinced you've either been convinced by others or have convinced yourself that nobody can do it as well as you. Yeah. Tell the truth, shame the devil. But part of what it means to be human and being able to recognize your humanity with your Christianity is understanding your limitations. Can I give that to you one more time? Part, part of what it means to be human and being able to reconcile your humanity with your Christianity is understanding your limitation. And that's where the dis-ease of imbalance happens. Because you have become so in tuned with your anointing that you've neglected your humanity. And now you've overextended yourself, leading to an imbalance. Lord Jesus, I wish I had somebody in here to help me understand. Watch, watch this. You, 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 you have to remember, I don't care how saved you are, you still human. Which means you still subject to some of the vulnerabilities that come with being human. And if you're not managing that tension well, you end up in a state of imbalance. Where you're, where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you're tired. You're stressed. You're overwhelmed. You're aggravated. Because, watch this, if I wasn't, if I wasn't, imbalanced and I was managing the tensions of my calling I wouldn't be tired I wouldn't be stressed I wouldn't be overwhelmed I wouldn't be aggravated because to be imbalanced means you do not have healthy parameters Lord I ain't got nobody to help me in here but help me here. You you don't you don't the, the reason you're tired, the reason you're stressed, the reason you're overwhelmed, the reason you're aggravated is because you don't have healthy parameters. 
You're good with function, but you're bad with practice. Let, let, let me give it to you like this, and then, we'll, and then we're, going, we're going to come to the table. Here it is. What, is. what is inherent in our calling is that we always defer, let go, or sacrifice for the sake of whatever we've been called to do. The tension is how do you manage the appropriate amount of sacrifice? Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you, in, we, we always defer, we do that, we do that. We defer, we let go, we sacrifice for the sake of whatever we've been called to do. We do those things. But the tension is, how do you manage the appropriate amount of sacrifice? What, what degree of sacrifice is too much sacrifice? What degree of sacrifice is not enough sacrifice? Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. How do you manage the appropriate amount of sacrifice? And, and more profound than even the sacrifice piece itself, we have to sustain some of our sense of self if we're going to be faithful to our calling. You don't lose your identity in your calling. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying here. Some, 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 people, some people are so much their position that they've forgotten their identity. Amen. Oh, Lord, help me in here today. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? They're, 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 they're so much who they've been called to be that they've neglected to take care of their humanity. That's why you're tired. That's why you're overwhelmed. That's why you're aggravated. Because you think that there's something holy about killing yourself. Jesus died so you don't have to. <laughs> Anybody hear what I'm saying? And, and so you become, you, 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 you think, you think that there's something, there's something supernatural and holy about mining your human limitations, which causes you to be imbalanced, which causes you to be doing what you're supposed to do, doing it where God told you to do it, but you're tired, you're stressed. You're overwhelmed. You're aggravated. It means you're doing something wrong. How can you be where God wants you to be? How can you be doing what God wants you to do and be hateful? How can you be doing what God wants you to do, where God wants you to do it, and be such a nasty person? It is because of imbalance. It's because of imbalance. So, so, so you're tired, you're aggravated, you're overwhelmed, and you're taking it all out on us. We have become victims of your disease of imbalance. So, 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 so to lose that connection, to lose the human connection to your calling is to lose your authenticity. It's to lose your authenticity. Now we have... Now we have a person who can no longer identify who they are doing ministry, trying to help other people find themselves. How does that work? How does it work losing you trying to help other people find them? It doesn't work. It, it does not work. So let's have a little bit of conversation. We've got about 
five or six minutes. Let's have one, and then we're, we're going we're gonna to pick this up because I want to continue to have this conversation about managing tension within the process of discerning our call, managing tension in the process of discerning our call. All right. Elder Felder, do we have any, any questions? Amen, amen, amen. Yes, we do. As a matter of fact, I think we want to stay right there in terms of imbalance. Okay. The question that came up, can you share some practical things we can do to avoid imbalances? Well, the, the, one of the things, see, 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 this is why it's so important that you don't lose touch with your humanity regardless of your depth of spirituality. Okay. Um, you have to know when you've had enough. Okay. You have to know when you've gone as far as you can safely go. Okay? Now, I do understand sometimes people push themselves beyond their boundaries and their limitations, but when you do that, you jeopardize your human limitations. And it causes you to respond and react in ways that are sometimes, um, for lack of a better term, uh, just not nice. Right. Just not nice. So, so, so you, you have to take some level of responsibility. For, exa for example, uh, if you know um, that you need to be ministering Sunday, okay. you know you need to be ministering Sunday, you know you're up before the people Sunday. Go to bed. <laughs> Amen. 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 Oh, okay, y'all. Y'all. Simple as. I'm, I'm, get some rest. One, 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 one of the things that I try my best not to do, and I know some people get a little aggravated sometimes, uh, but I, I try my best not to do stuff on Saturday that's going to keep me out too late. Amen. Amen. Because I know that on the normal circumstance, I got to come into this church and I got to preach at 8 o'clock and then I got to turn around and preach again at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Amen. Common sense. Common sense. I don't need the Holy Ghost for this one. Common <laughs> sense would tell me, one, I'm not young as I used to be. Okay, okay. That, that's common sense. Gotcha. I'm not young as I used to be. Number two, if I'm going to make it through this, I know, I know, don't y'all get deep on me. I know the Lord going to be there and he going to help. The anointing going to come. I, I understand all of that. I ain't talking about that. I need to take my hind parts to bed. Amen. Amen. And I need to take myself to bed at a decent hour. That's I it. can't be running up and down the street 10, 11 o'clock at night on Saturday night trying to see all of this and do all of this and, and make this thing over here and make this event over here. And then 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, and then I got to come in here? Come I'm not at my best. Amen. That's it. Y'all yeah, understand what I'm saying? You, you're not at your best. And Gardner Taylor, Gardner Taylor says the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost deserves a couple of things. Yes. The Holy Ghost deserves to be present in a well-prepared message. Not one that you threw together because you didn't have time because you knew you had to preach, but you didn't start working on it till Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, okay, nobody help me. So the Holy Ghost deserves uh, the presentation of a well-prepared message, but secondly, the Holy Ghost deserves to use a well-rested vessel. Amen. 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 Because trust me when I tell you, when you're tired, you can't hear like you need to hear. That's right. That's right. And God trying to talk to you, and you yawning. You tired. Y'all, you know what I'm saying? You, he can't, you, you, you too tired to hear him. So we have to learn how to manage. Me too. We got to learn how to manage these tensions that come within our calling so that we don't lose connection with our humanity. Amen. So, so, so yeah. Go to bed. Get some rest. Take some time for you. Amen. If you need to do that. Right. And, and you, you know when you ain't at yourself. Come on, Dr. Yeah. Fletcher. You know, know when you cranky. I know. I 
I know. Come on. You, you know, and you know that there's something causing that. That's right. Amen. The time. <laughs> Practical. Practical. Yeah. Okay. Reverend Fletcher, you have anything? Yes. Oh, oh, I wrote a few down. Go All ahead, right. sir. One of the things you've been talking about constantly is our level of maturity should be shown as, as we're going on this journey. Right. And my question is, how is this growth being measured? How, 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 how can you know? How good is question. It being measured? Good, good question. Well, a, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is measured um, both spiritually, emotionally, uh, and even in some ways physically. Um, how, how do I do that? One of the things I know that I'm growing because um, I can I can take more. Yes, absolutely, I can I can take more. I know I know I'm getting better because when I'm thinking about it, if you had did that last year, it was going to turn out. It was going to turn out a, a whole lot different. <laughs> but sure. but but now, okay, you know, okay. It, I'm just kind of like, oh, okay. That's good. God bless you. There have you a, go. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. And then I even shout myself. Right. So that, that's, that's one of the ways. Another way you know is because you begin to hear God in those moments a whole lot different and clearer. Mm -hmm. you, 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 ever been, you, ever been, you ever been trying to listen to, uh, you ever been trying to listen to a, a, a radio station or something and it ain't clear, got a lot of static? Mm -hmm. You can <laughs> kind of make out what's happening, okay. but, yeah. but you can't, you don't have clarity. Well, one of the ways you know is when that is when that static starts to clear up a little bit, Amen. Mm. Amen. and and Amen. there's a and, and it becomes a lot clearer, a whole lot clearer, okay. a whole lot clearer. Um, disposition is always a good measure. Okay. That, 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 disposition that, 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 is always okay. is That's always a good, yes. Yes. A, good a good measure. And I would even add to that, even how you even how you treat and interact with people who would prefer not to interact with you. Mm. Ah, okay, <clears throat> okay. That's me, there. Wow. That's, that's real me. Yeah, wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That goes into that, somebody just, just threw in a question and the question is, what advice do you have in dealing with people in leadership who are overextended where he or she is constantly operating under imbalance? Whoa, that's that's a good question. That that <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, this is where the accountability and the trusted voices piece comes in. Okay. We all need people in our life that we are accountable to, and accountability means that somebody in your space has permission to tell you the truth about you. They they have. They have, the, they have the permission to say, uh, Dr. Fletcher, you, you ain't at yourself today. Okay. Um, you, you, you off your, your, your game today. Yeah. Some, somebody, you got to have somebody in your space yes. that can do that. Yes. You, you, you can't be a renegade out here with, with, with no accountability. You got to have somebody who's able to discern and, and who cares more about you than they do their relationship with you. Come on. Mm. Okay. Come on. That I'm, I, I'm willing to lose the relationship at the expense of telling you the truth. Wow. wow. Amen. That's Amen. good. That's accountability. That's good. That's what real accountability is. Um, that, there's a problem when people tell you the truth, you get mad and don't speak to them no more. There's something wrong with you. Amen. Amen. There's something wrong with that. So, so, so accountability, trusted voices are important. Somebody in your space needs to be able to pull your coattail yes. and say something is wrong, something is, something is off, something's not right, you're not yourself. Let's figure out what this is. Amen. 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 That's how you do that. And, and you may be a leader, and the person who, who is your accountability or trusted voice may not be a leader. Mm, okay. 
See, 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 sometimes we think that only people above us can tell us stuff. Uh, okay. But sometimes it's the people below us. Mm-hmm. Amen. That can, and when I say that, I don't mean that in a condescending way. Right. I just mean that you have a position and then they don't. Amen. That, that I, I, remember, I remember a, uh, a preacher friend of mine who pastors a church, and he has probably about, I don't know, he probably has about nine, 10,000 members. Uh, But his pastor, his pastor has a church who has less than 500 members. Okay. And you would be wondering, what in the world Mm -hmm. can this person learn, this person who has 10,000 members learn from a person who has less than 500. Wow. So, so sometimes, sometimes we undervalue gifts based on perception. Mm. Just because you don't wear a collar doesn't mean you're not anointed. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's oh, good. I that's wish good. I had somebody yeah, to hear what I said. Just, just, just because you don't get up in the pulpit doesn't mean your gift should be undervalued. Amen. Cool. Amen. Brother Fletcher? Now, here, here's one that, that's been eating at me for a while, Pastor. All right. And you often say that as we're on this journey, I hear this word, you ought to see fruit. Now, fruit is a metaphor. It, it, it's a of course good metaphor. Is. Yeah, of course. But can you give some more realistic metaphors? I, I, I heard you say something about hateful people in these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I need some, some, something that I should be gleaning on, that I should look for, I, some, 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 something other than a, when I say you ought to see their fruit. I need something that I can grab my hands on to see it, because I, I don't want to cast, cast them away or, 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 or ignore them. Or, or. But you're, well, first of all, you're asking a, several questions in one question. Uh, that's that's first thing, um, and I and I think fruit is the best metaphor um, for a lot of reasons. One being the process that fruit goes through to become fruit. It 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 doesn't. It, the apple doesn't start as apple. That's right. It seed. starts as a seed, Amen. and it goes through a process to become what it is. So I think when we're talking about when we're talking about fruit, we're not talking about just the end result. Okay. We're talking okay. about process. Okay. Yes. That, that's, how, how, that's does this, how does this orange become an orange? Right. How does this apple become an apple? Right. And I think we dismiss the process because we're so impressed with the end product. Okay. Okay. And, and we're not appreciating that there's a process involved. Now, how does that translate into our interaction with people. One of the ways it transfers into our interaction with people is I can see, I can see this end result over here, but when I'm paying attention and discerning process, I can better appreciate somebody that I at least know is trying to be better. Yes, that's right. Because yeah, that's right. They're, they're at least submitting themselves to yeah. a process. Okay. Now, okay. Does, do, do they always get it right every time? No. No, they don't always get it right every time. But I can see that they have submitted themselves to a process in an attempt to try to be better and become a better version of themselves. So I don't think we need to dismiss the metaphor because there's a whole lot more to the metaphor okay. than just the end product of the metaphor. Okay. You understand that, what I'm that, saying? That's good. That's so, good. So, so sometimes we have to trust that process, and when you see that process playing out, when you see it in action, okay. then you can at least appreciate the fact. Amen. You can appreciate that you know, the apple ain't quite ripe. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> There it is. There it is. Okay. That, that's that is, it. That, that's right. it. That's, that's it's, what I'm it's, looking for. It's green. Yeah. Right. But right, it's, right. It's, it's getting red. Yeah, you can right, see right. it's an it's, apple, it's, but it's, yeah, it's not quite okay. It ain't quite ripe yet. Okay. okay. You got you to gotta give it an now, opportunity. That, that's, that, that's what I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, give it an give it opportunity to, to ripen. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You made mention earlier about uh, 
uh, being told wrong information. Mm -hmm. A question came up, and I know it's probably some part, it had to do with baptism. It said, is a person saved if they believe water baptism is a part of salvation? That's just... Yeah, and, and now we're getting into a, a doctrinal issue. Right. I think That's we're getting a, into right. a doctrinal issue that is really not germane to this conversation. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different beliefs about a lot of different right. things uh, that are really not necessarily uh, uh, genuinely, biblically, however, depending on how you read the scripture, okay. uh, really connected to that. Right. For example, you got some churches who serve communion every Sunday. Right. And you got some who serve communion once a month. Mm -hmm. And I even know some churches who only serve it once a year. Mm. Uh, but but is, is that really germane to salvation? No, I think that's more, I think that's more practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's more how people theologically practice what they believe rather than it being an issue uh, of salvation. Amen. Because there's too, many, there's too many other dynamics that come into play in a situation like that, like baptism. If you're telling me that baptism is essential to salvation, then what about that person who is on their deathbed and they can't be baptized? That, that, and they can't Amen. be immersed in water. That means you're going to have to come up with some alternative in order to complete that process. Gotcha. So I think you got a whole lot of different nuances that you got to deal with. Right. Uh, and so now you've gotten off into a, a doctrinal right. issue okay. more so than you've gotten off into anything right. I, else. I didn't want to Yeah, decide. but that, no, that's okay. Yeah. That, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Well, that's all I have. Unless you well, have good. Any, um, that's questions. all I have. Well, well great. Yeah. Well, we're going to pick up this conversation next week about managing those tensions. Mm. Uh, and prayerfully, that will be helpful to all of us uh, because uh, we can know that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, where we're supposed to be doing it, and still not feeling uh, the strongest uh, in there and still not be operating at 100% capacity like that. And so we need to learn how to manage those, manage those tensions. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit next time. Thank you all. Let's um, have a word of prayer, if we will, before we go. Father, we thank you today for your goodness, your mercy, your loving kindness. Thank you for uh, the Holy Ghost, who is our real teacher, uh, and we're just a vessel. And we pray, God, that what's said uh, reaches the heart of somebody that helps to transform, mature, grow, and develop them, uh, even into the stronger person that you're calling them to be. We pray, God, for somebody who may be in that place where they're struggling with managing their tensions. We pray, God, that your word will help us uh, to be cured from this disease, this dis-ease of imbalance, and that you will begin to speak to our heart about our physical, mental, emotional, and our spiritual health, because we know that you've come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And so, Father, we pray that you help us to get there and live there. Now, bless us and keep us until we come back together again. And for that, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. 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 All right.